Yes, uh, my name is Joe Hinchliffe, and I, I'm here to talk about uh, my uh, DIY space projects. So, it all began in about 2012. I'd just finished um, uh, a really big kind of project. Um, I'd, built a, I'd designed and built a modular synthesizer, as one does in the evenings. Um, and I'd, I'd finished this big project, and I was kind of looking around to see what's my next kind of project going to be that I take on. And I came across this chap. This is a South Korean gentleman called Ho Jun Song. And at the time, he was building and launching... Um, oh, I should tell you, Ho Jun Song is a conceptual artist. That's, what he, that's how he earns his living. He uh, does great big sort of installations in art galleries and public spaces and creates art events. Um, but at the time, he, was, uh, he decided that he was going to build and launch a satellite. He's not an engineer, he's an artist. He decided that he'd, uh, he'd, he'd, he'd build and launch a satellite. So I found that really inspiring, because he was a bit like me, and he'd taken on this project. So I did a little bit of research, and th the thing that Hojin was building was a 10 centimeter cubed uh, type of satellite. And I quickly realized that they're like a recognized type of satellite called a CubeSat. And uh, thousands of these have been launched, well, hundreds of these have been launched, and thousands of them are in development around the world. And they get taken to space on a rocket, a bit bigger than this one, or sometimes they get delivered to the International Space Station. They get flung out of a jack-in-a-box and they go around the Earth um, for a period of time. It is really a jack-in-a-box, I promise. Um, and they, they send data back and they carry out little missions and they test um, sort of components and uh, some of them are engineering exercises for the people who build them. But what, what really excited me and the bit that got me a bit hooked was I realized that anybody can download the specification document for them. I know that sounds tremendously, it's not the most lively read, but it gives you all the information that you need to, and all the rules that you need to follow so that anybody could actually have a go and build this satellite. Now, of course, I'm making it sound incredibly easy, which it isn't, but it's, it was interesting, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to take on as a bit of a thought game, I'm going to see how close I could get to building something that goes into space, knowing, knowing that I would fail. And that's okay, because it's really hard, so everybody expects you to fail, so that's really good. So, um, so I'd read about these CubeSats, but then, and, and there were lots of them, lots of examples online, but then I got really excited about this. So the guy who wrote the specification for CubeSats is a guy called Professor Bob Twiggs, and he also wrote a specification for these things, and they're essentially exactly the same, but they're smaller. Um, so they're 50 millimeters cubed. <gasps> I fell in love with that. So people are building satellites a.k.a. spaceships, that can fit in your pocket. <laughs> I got really excited by that. So I thought, do you know what? This is what I'm into. Only four of these have launched to date in 2014. And, um, but there's lots more scheduled to launch, and there's, there's quite a community now developing them around the world. This one's my favorite. Um, this was built by... So this is exactly this size, and it launched in 2014, and it was called Wren. And it was built by three German chaps um, in their bedrooms and their basements and in their shed. And um, when it was kind of launched, there was lots of people online discussing uh, this, this. And they were saying, it's one of the most sophisticated, sa sophisticated satellites that's ever been built, including the multi-million dollar ones. And one of the reasons for that was that... Um, so the guy, one of the guys, Paul Cusilla, um, designed into a space this size, so one of these little boards, he built an eight-channel thruster system using pulse plasma thruster technology. Don't worry, there won't be a test later. You don't have to know what that means. But basically it meant that as it zipped around the Earth once every 90 minutes, it could slightly change where it was and it could correct its orbit and, and sort of stay up there for longer. What was fascinating about that, though, was it was these three guys in their kind of sheds. And at the time, there was lots of universities working on pulse plasma thruster technologies, and they'd built some as well. But, but theirs tended to be about this big, and have taken about a, a few million in funding, and uh, you know, weren't ready for space. And Paul, in his shed, managed to kind of make eight on this tiny little board. So it was a phenomenally inspiring thing. So I was talking about a lot of this stuff on, on, on my blog and on Facebook and on Twitter and, and sort of trying to engage other makers and seeing if, if people were interested. And then I started getting asked to go and do talks, a bit like here today. So I thought, well, I've got to build something because it's, it's a bit useless to look at a talk 
and not having anything to show. Or, or I got asked to talk at maker fairs where everybody has like, you know, robots and 3D printers and I'd be there with like, you know, just, just me kind of stood there with a picture. So I decided to make something. So I thought I'll have a go at making one. So this is what I made. This is what I've got in my hand here. Um, I made it in my shed. I made some circuit boards using a very kind of hobbyist techniques. You can etch the copper off this special board, and, and um, it's quite a sort of lo-fi way of making circuit boards. Um, I bought so on the bottom layer, there's a, a microcontroller which I bought um, off a, an electronics hobbyist shop. Um, so it's basically a little computer on the bottom, and on the top there's a radio module that I bought and designed into the, the circuit board on the top. And what it does is I can pop it on a desk and turn it on, and it will radio out a message, and I can use a little bit of um, technology uh, connected to my laptop at the other end of the desk, and I can receive the radio transmission and decode it. And it's good for showing people how things work. So it's a model. There's loads of things that would fail on this. If I sent it to like a space lab and they didn't run tests on it, it would fail on, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things. But building this actually made me, th it made me realize there's a few things it would pass on. So, for example, the radio I used, although it's kind of, I, I, I bought it as a hobbyist, it's space rated, so that wouldn't fail. The microcontroller I've used has flown in space, not this particular one, but other, other ones of it. Um, the boards that I've used are the type of technology that was used in space uh, some years ago, and certainly home X boards have flown in space over the history of space stuff. Um, I built it accurately enough, because I'm quite pedantic about being accurate with sizes, um, and if you put it on, a, on an engineer's surface table and an engineer put a height gauge on it and all this kind of clever measuring stuff, it would pass that it's been built accurately enough dimensionally wise to kind of work. So you build this model in your shed and you think, okay, it's fa it fails on so many things, but hmm, there's a few percent where actually it would be okay. So on, on, onwards with the inspiration, the little things that you do kind of make you realize that more and more is possible. So I was going off and I was talking at shows and talking uh, at, to, to different groups about this stuff and talking about it online. And slowly a community kind of began to form around these and they're called pocket cubes. So now there's quite a vibrant uh, community online. One of the things that we did in the community is we, um, uh, so I hosted a little online forum for a while and uh, uh, there's a, a gentleman who's really involved in pocket cubes called Tom Walkinshaw who runs a LinkedIn group um, and between that, my forum and Twitter, um, we had lots of means of communication. And one of the things that we did was we decided that there should be an, an enhanced specification for some of the aspects of these, these little satellites. So it was the size of the circuit boards and the ways that the, the circuit boards connect to each other is basically what's in this specification. And again, it's free. If you're really excited by reading about circuit board sizes, knock yourself out. You can find it online. Um, but, but what this did was it suddenly meant that people could collaborate. So me in my shed in North Wales, I don't have to make everything if I want to make a pocket cube anymore. There are other people around the world, and if we're all working to this same specification, it means that we can share ideas, we can share parts of the technology, we can physically send somebody uh, a part that will fit in their miniature satellite that they're building. So that's a rather wonderful outcome. And all it came out of was people talking and becoming passionate. The other thing is it also means that people can commercialize uh, the stuff that they're building. So this is a board that was put together by Stuart McAndrew down in Australia. Down, is that the right term? I don't know, around in Australia. Um, and it was the first one that was built to this new specification. And he can sell that now. He can sell that to other people around the world who want to build these, these craft. Um, so now there's about four or five businesses around the world that are all making and selling pocket cube um, components. Led um, actually by a British company. Um, there's a guy in, in Glasgow called Tom who runs pocketcubeshop.com and you can pretty much go on there and buy a complete pocket cube satellite if you want. And then you've got to try and find somebody to take it to space, which is a bit more complex. But um, it's getting to the point where you could buy a spaceship off the shelf. Um, so the chap who put this, uh, this last board together, uh, Stuart, is, um, he's building Australia, he's an amateur like me, and he's building Australia's first pocket cube satellite. 
And rather brilliantly, um, he's asked me to build uh, the chassis that his satellite componentry is going to go into, which is a very small job. He, he will have done 99.99999% of the development of this satellite, but I actually get to build the chassis that it will hopefully go into when it gets launched. He's looking at possibly launching later this year or next year. Um, so he currently represents the fact that uh, uh, he's probably my best chance of actually getting something into space in the next couple of years, which is, will be a wonderful moment for me. So other things that this journey has led me on to, I realised that making my own sort of uh, circuit boards by etching them uh, in my kitchen and annoying my family with all these strange chemicals hanging around wasn't a good idea. So I've taught myself, um, again using community resources, um, f to use a, a commercial quality but a free and open source package to design my electronic systems. Um, these are some boards that I've had manufactured, so I design them on the computer, send them away and they send me back the boards. Um, interesting, this is quite a rare skill. Even a lot of sort of academic people who do an e electronics engineering degree come out at the end and they don't actually have this last bit because it's more of an industrial thing. Um, so it's actually the, the two of those are just ones that I've built for my own projects. But this big triangular one is actually a bit of commercial work that I got out of this. I was working with a company helping them design a prototype and, and I, I got paid to kind of lay out the PCB. So it's led to me getting bits of work. Um, I also, there's lots of people online, there's massive communities that all help each other out with electronics, but one area I realised that was missing in this whole DIY scene is there's not as many people online talking about how you make metal things. That's my simple way of putting it. So machining and using sort of engineering and big engineering machines to actually make structures. So I took myself back off to college, um, did a, a two-year evening class and, and learnt about um, lathes and milling machines. And then I've ended up bi uh, building my own. This is a computer-controlled milling machine that, that moves a, a, a Dremel-type tool around and can cut things out of metal. Um, which in turn has led to me having a really odd CV now. Because I've got all my daytime stuff, the stuff that I do with my freelance training design, I do a lot of health promotion and things, but I've also now got a diploma in performing engineering operations to stick on there. <laughs> I've also got a certificate from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, because I did, this was fantastic, I did the, um, this is an online course, uh, an introduction to aerospace engineering, astronautics and human spaceflight. If any of you have a passing interest in, in, in science, uh, in space, and you want to spend four months of your life taking about 10 to 15 hours a week to do quite a lot of maths and quite a lot of walking around muttering and drawing things in the air and scratching your head. This is the course for you. But, uh, but it was absolutely fantastic. And I was, it was a privilege to be on the first cohort of this uh, and to pass as well, which was a bit of a miracle, but there we go. <laughs> um, so yes, it sits well on the old CV. Um, during that time, you'd find me in laybys between meetings working on um, rocket design problems as one does, uh, whilst eating a sandwich. And then it's also led me, this whole obsession has led me into working with, with other people on their projects. So last year, um, I worked with Paul, who was the guy who built the pulse plasma thruster thing that was very clever that I mentioned earlier. He's working on another experimental thruster, um, which I machined some parts for him last year. Um, did really well. It, was, it, it went onto a global website called Hackaday, which is really well known in sort of hardware maker circles. And it was entered into uh, the Hackaday prize. And we, even though it didn't really fit with what they were looking for as entrance, we managed to get through to the semi finals. So we got thousands and thousands of hits, and lots and lots of people, hundreds of people commenting and engaging and asking questions and, and getting interesting. It also means that this picture of mine is now sort of internet famous. My fingers appear all over the internet holding this little thing and, and there's like little articles and that this, this, this image of my fingers in my shed appears quite a lot, which is a bit bizarre. Um, <laughs> I'm also working on, um, so as I said, these things get shoved out of a little jacular box, which is just a set of rails with a spring behind it. Not very high tech, really, but they're, they're quite difficult to manufacture the deployers. And so what I'm, I'm also involved in trying to build a version of the deployer that can be made um, in a way where other people could make it from th for using the tools that they could find in a small maker space, so in a, in a basic kind of fab lab. So again, it makes it more community accessible that people can start to explore with this technology. 
Um, I'm also into rockets. You can't get into space without getting into rockets. And um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I've started building and launching rockets, and I hope over the next couple of years to get into um, launching bigger rockets. But I have to go and do some exams and some certif certification documents and things, because apparently you're not allowed to just build really big rockets and launch them. Who knew? Um, <laughs> but actually, the UK Rocketry Association, really supportive of people because there's not, there's not a massive amount of interest in, in the, the hands-on side of this, so they're really keen to see people um, taking it on and building rockets and having fun with science and, and these sort of technologies. Um, this thing here, I'm also building, this is uh, uh, about 12 quids worth of off-the-shelf components which I've put together and put some code on um, and in partnership with a guy called John Story, who I'm working with. And it's a, a payload for a rocket that means that people can, when they fire a model rocket, even quite a little one, they can work out how high it went, how fast it got there, and they can work out the air pressure and the temperature, all kinds of things, and get a bit of data back off it. Um, and at the moment, if you wanted to buy something like that, they're between, I don't know, 50, 60, 80 pounds up to, you could spend thousands on it. So again, I'll open source this into the community, I'll, and the, hopefully the community will take it on and some people will build them and use them, but other people might build, the, build them and develop them and make them better, and then I can use them uh, with the enhanced spec that the community builds into them. Um, so yeah, launching rockets is my new thing, and uh, this one's hopefully going to get a launch this year. Um, uh, this is one that I launched a while ago, and, and this, this picture did quite well on the internet because everybody said, oh, you've, have you invented time travel as well? <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I forgot to set the date on the camera, so it, it looks like I've invented time travel as well, but there we go. <laughs> so my leaving shot for you is... Um, don't be afraid of taking on things that people, other people think are pointless or just a bit playful or a bit fanciful because you can teach yourself the most amazing things and the most amazing communities exist out there in the real world and online that will help you enlighten your passion, whatever it is. Thank you very much and thanks for listening.